Good morning to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, today is Sunday, October 18, 2020, and we are so blessed that we are able to share with you this morning our Sunday school lesson. I bring you greetings from Friendship Baptist Church, located on the west side of Chicago, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, where our pastor is the Dr. Reginald E. Backus. And we are so blessed that even in the midst of this COVID pandemic, of our socially distancing and sheltering in place when possible, that we are still able to use the technology and the gifts of God to continue to pump out these Sunday school lessons. Uh, on behalf of our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of our instructors, our students and the members and officers of this great church, uh, wherever you are and whoever you may be with, we just praise God for your dedication, your sacrifice, the time that you've taken to share out with us. Uh, we have a very familiar lesson today. It's the uh, lesson of the Good Samaritan. Uh, one of the stories that uh, is so familiar to all of those, all of us, those of us that have been raised in the church. Uh, our lesson comes from the 10th chapter of Luke, verses 25 through 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. If by chance you're a member of Friendship Baptist Church or you're looking for a regular Sunday school class, all of our classes are continuing to meet either by the Zoom app or by conference call. So you can reach out to your instructor or call the church, email us, and we'll get you your class information. And then we'll also continue to put these lessons out on Facebook every Sunday morning at 930. Uh, so uh, if you do have a class, we ask that you please join that class, and then you're also welcome to join us as well. Again, our lesson, The Good Samaritan, it's entitled Meeting the Needs of Others, taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And our key verse this morning is Luke chapter 10, 36 and 37. It says, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our opportunity to share in your word. Uh, Father, we thank you for the time that you've given us to be able to take a moment and focus on Christian education, on learning more about your will for our lives, about how we are to live according to, uh, to the salvation that you have blessed and gifted to each and every one of us. Father, help us to first recognize that we are not perfect, that there are still some things that does not belong in each and every one of us, that we still have a lot of growing to do, that we still have a long way to go in our Christian journey. Help this lesson be able to further us along that road. Lift us up higher that we might see you clear. Let the words in my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So meeting the needs of others, Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. So our goal this morning, first we will understand who Jesus meant when he used the word neighbor. Second, we will learn to value all people the same way that God does. And third, finally, we will commit to living a life that shows love and mercy to those in need, especially to those that are different than we are. Uh, so much of the Old Testament, the Levitical law is designed around the way that we treat others. Loving God and loving others is the way in which Jesus Christ summarized the commandments. They asked Jesus what was the most important commandment. He says, uh, love your God with all thy heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And in those two commandments, Jesus summarized the, to the Ten Commandments and all of the Levitical law. For it, when we love God and when we love others, it is almost impossible to willingly and willfully sin against others here on earth. Uh, the truth is, oftentimes when we sin, it's because we devalue the person we're sinning against. Uh, if we take something from somebody, we assume that they don't need it. If we treat someone poorly, we assume that they don't deserve to be treated with respect. Uh, and I could go down the list and run the gauntlet, but the truth is, most of the time when we sin in life is because we overvalue ourselves or we undervalue others, and we use that value to dictate how we treat people. So this lawyer, he stands before Jesus soliciting an expert testimony in order to define or even limit who exactly qualifies as a neighbor. And then Jesus uses the example of the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, in order to highlight that true neighborly love is not reserved for a particular group or type of people but instead is available for all to partake in. If we allow the love of God to motivate us and not concern or worry ourselves uh, uh, with enriching ourselves and how others might perceive it, uh, we, we would be a lot better off in the way we treat others and the way we live our lives. 
Uh, so our lesson is broken down into four parts. The first part comes in uh, verses 25 through 28. And I'll read the text again, the New King James Version of Luke chapter 10. Verse 25, it reads, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Now, in a world in which we are easily deceived into believing that we don't have enough, for the second week in a row, we are challenged to let go of our hold on the blessings that God has given us. Now, um, what I've learned in life is that blessings, wealth, rich, rich, riches are all, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, relative. That's a great word. They're all relative. Uh, I grew up uh, as a child, not really knowing more than what my parents exposed me to. And I thought we were the richest kids in the world. I had toys, I had clothes, and I could run around the house and do what I want. Never was too cold, never was too hot. And I just thought it didn't get any better than that. Uh, in retrospect, I, I, I now think about some of those, and I think you know, Lindsay's in here with me. I think about some of them spam Thanksgiving dinners and some of them ramen noodle uh, lunches. And we weren't quite as wealthy as I thought we were. And I think about some of the toys I got. I didn't always get the G.I. Joy toy. Sometimes it's got Green Army Man. <laughs> but, but even though I didn't have everything, back then I thought I was rich. But as I got, started to get exposed to some people that had some real wealth, some real money, I quickly realized that there was a lot more uh, out there to get. Uh, then I was blessed in 2007 to go to Africa, Blantai and Malawi, one of the poorest. It was the poorest country in the time at the world number two, now behind Haiti. And I saw poverty on a scale in which I could never imagine. I saw uh, thousands of, well, literally a thousand kids in a school sleeping on the floor, dipping their bowls in a pot of porridge, drinking it and passing the bowl behind, to the kid behind them as they ate lunch. And I quickly realized that uh, growing up thinking I'm rich, then meeting some real rich people, realizing I was broke, and then going to Africa and meeting the poorest of the poor, and realizing that when I didn't think I had much, I had more than I could ever need. It was an eye-opening experience. And I think all of us have been through some type of experience like that in our own lives where we come to realize that we may not have thought we had a lot or everything we wanted, only to see other situations and realize that we are overly blessed, that we got so much. If you got more than one outfit in your house, more than one option of food to eat in your fridge, if you can set the temperature on your thermostat and it changes, uh, uh, we have more, m most of us drive to church or got a bus we can get on. I mean, God has blessed us so much, but still the trick of the world is to teach us that we don't have a lot, we don't have enough. And because the world teaches us, we have this tight vice grip on what little that we have, thinking that we, our mandate in life is to keep it protect it, increase it, grow it. And that entire way of life has caused us to drift away living a life according to what God has for us and instead living a life that's only meant to accumulate wealth and, uh, and, and further our own self-interest. <sighs> that was a lot. Uh, but, but the truth is that this trick of the world works still on us today. The most seasons of, of saints, if a homeless person asked us for money, We'll first count how much we have in our pocket before we freely give. If, if, if someone asks us to drop them off somewhere, we'll think about our gas tank before we immediately say yes. The world teaches us that we must first protect our own self-interest before trying to do for others. And that's what this entire lesson is doing. Uh, we don't let go because we don't think we can replace it. We don't let go because we don't think we already have enough. We don't let go for a myriad uh, or multiple different or multiple reasons However, uh, this lesson is designed to teach us that God has blessed us for the very reason to be a blessing to others. The blessings of God's kingdom are meant to further his kingdom. And what better way to do that than to use them as a way to show God's love? Uh, God has not blessed us for us to be rich. God has not blessed us for us to look down on others. God has not 
blessed us for us to retreat into our wealth or our possession or our riches and turn a blind eye to the atrocities that take place right outside our front doors. But instead, God blesses us so that we can have the resources, the ability, the talent, the gifts, the money to change the things that we see happening by the aid of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the lawyer asked a question for both clarification and absolution. Uh, we sometimes play semantics in order to excuse, excuse ourselves from responsibilities that we know we should take on. Uh, one thing that's going on right now is uh, it was a bit bombshell story in the New York Times two weeks ago, which sounds like, which it feels like months and years ago now, but it turns out President 45 did not pay his taxes uh, or his fair share of taxes. As a matter of fact, uh, 2016 and 2017, it's been reported that he only paid $750 in taxes. Now, regardless if this was legal or not, regardless if this was uh, according to the tax code or not, we all know it's not fair. And what happens in life is we find loopholes and we play semantics in order to take the responsibility off our shoulders and pass the butt to someone else. Now, I'm sure the president has great lawyers and accountants that he paid a lot of money to to make sure he paid the least amount of taxes. And as a matter of fact, if we all had that same amount of money and the same amount of resources, I'm pretty sure that we would find some way to do something similar to lower our tax burden. However, if the president who claims to be worth multiple billions of dollars, then his fair share in order to ease the burden of the entire country meant that he should have paid a lot more than $750. The problem is the world teaches us that whenever we can cut a corner, we cut a corner. Whenever we can find a shortcut, we take the shortcut. And the problem is that most people, uh, the oligarchs of life, have gotten rich off the backs of others because their wealth, their possessions, their riches have allowed them to cut corners that others can't. That's why the top 0.1% of this country owns the majority of the wealth. The bottom 99.9% .9 of this country owns nothing. And blacks, the disparities are even larger. And still yet, those that are in charge and rich get richer, while those are poor get poorer because people are looking for loopholes to absolve them, remove their responsibility for their share of the, uh, of, of the burden. And this lawyer is doing the same thing. This lawyer recognizes what the word of God says, that we must show brotherly love to all people, yet he's trying to create and map out loopholes to absolve him of that responsibility. And we do the same thing ourselves. We do the same thing ourselves. Uh, the lawyer, like most, is looking for a way to earn his salvation. And he recognizes that uh, the requirements of salvation are something that he doesn't want to give, even when it's so little. God doesn't tell us to pay our way into heaven because those of us that were broke would never get in. God doesn't tell us to sing our way into heaven because those of us with no voice would never make it. All God does is says treat people the same way we want to be treated and love God like you love none other. That's how you get into heaven. It's by sacrificing, by letting go and accepting the gift of God. But still this lawyer is trying to find a way to make it in without letting go of what he has while holding on. And the truth is, my brothers and sisters, if we've learned anything in these past seven or eight weeks in Sunday school, is that you can't both hold on to the world and hold on to your salvation. There's a requirement that you let go of one. And our connection, our dedication, our determination to hold on to these earthly possessions uh, to protect what little bit we have runs afoul of holding on to our salvation. You can't do both, and eventually we, you'll have to let go. Uh, it is the obedience to God that gives us everlasting life, a trust in him that surpasses logic, a comfort in knowing that he will continue to provide even when we let go of what we have. The truth is, and uh, I don't know what your banking situation looks like, I say it all the time. I don't have enough to take care of my responsibility. But still, somehow, some way, God figures out how to make it work week after week, month after month, year after year in my life. And so my attitude shouldn't be so concerned with holding on to what little I have because whenever I didn't have enough, God provided anyway. So I should instead take this opportunity or take all the chances that present themselves to me to use what I have to be a blessing to others, trusting that my obedience will spurn and push, motivate God to bless me with more. The truth is, some of us aren't blessed 
don't have more, don't have the resources that we desire because we've been so selfish and stingy with what we have. And God's saying, what's the point of giving you more when you haven't used what little you have to further the kingdom of God? If we're not tithing, if we're not giving, if we're not sacrificing, then what motivation does God have to bless us with more? Uh, he gave his life before we were formed. Uh, and so that takes into account that God sacrificed himself before we were even thought of, which means that God doesn't care about our position. God doesn't care about our titles. God doesn't care about our notoriety. God gave his son and his son Jesus gave his life before we were even formed to highlight that love has no uh, boundaries, that love has no limits, that love is free for all regardless of who they are, what they look like, or what they sound like. If we had to be qualified in order to receive the blessings of God, heaven would show be empty. But thank God, God saved us, looked past our faults, and decided to bless us in spite of our shortcomings. So not only do we see the basic commandments in the lives of believers, verses 25 through 28, in verse 29, we, see, uh, we answer the question, who is my neighbor? So this idea of the non-neighbor pops up. And we have been inundated with this since 2008 when President Obama was elected uh, with this idea of the DACA, of the Dreamers, these illegal immigrants. And it's nothing new. Even back when they were forming the, uh, uh, when they were freeing the slaves, they had to argue over how much of a person was a slave, uh, recognizing that the boom in population from uh, free slaves being citizens in the South would give the Democrats uh, the voting edge over the Northern Republicans who won the Civil War. And so they actually had to define a black, free black man as three-fifths of a person in order to uh, make sure the voting numbers were uh, set. Our country, since it has been formed, has been arguing over this question, who is a neighbor? And the question is, uh, if, if we go before those three ships that Columbus sailed and now modern uh, the uh, historians are now finding evidence that the uh, Vikings um, possibly landed before Columbus, but whoever landed first, there was already an indigenous people here in America, the Native American. Uh, and to be honest, anyone that does not look like them was a neighbor that came into this country without invitation. Yet, because we have power and wealth and have been afforded the chance to make the laws and the rules that dictate this country, we have now redefined what the word neighbor means, and depending on the, the president is at the time, depends on who's able to come into this country. There once was a time where people seeking a religious freedom, uh, freedom from political oppression, freedom from illegal taxation, could come to the West, to the United States of America, and seek an opportunity to have a fair chance at enriching themselves. However, the first few boats of settlers that landed, instead of passing that opportunity onto the nets, all they sought to do was limit that opportunity so that they can increase their wealth. And still now, some 400 years later, we see some of the same families that originally enriched themselves on the backs of others that they refused to recognize as neighbors, still uh, just redistributing their wealth amongst themselves and limiting the amount of wealth that others have access to because they are the ones in charge. My brothers and sisters, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps in God's wisdom, he limited the, the, the economic power that blacks have in America. Uh, because after so many years of oppression, who knows what we would do with the authority to set the rules and dictate how we treat others. But perhaps this lesson can be uh, a motivation for us that when we accumulate wealth, when we get riches, when we have money, when there's something in our pocket, when we have something to lose, that we, don't inst that we don't hold on to it as if we'll never get another shot, but instead we let it loose and use it to bless others and further the kingdom of God. Uh, this country was founded on religious principles that all men are created equal under God, yet we've spent the last 100 years redefining this word of neighbor in order to limit the rights of others based on where they come from, what they look like, what language they speak, or their education. And my brothers and sisters, it's the most ungodly concept ever, and our country is falling deep into it. And now we, African-Americans, black folks, who once weren't considered people, then three-fifths of a person, had dolls and hoses turned on us just for trying to vote. Now we've fallen into the trap of locking up our borders and 
and, and not wanting others to come in worrying about where our jobs will go. Uh, that's not brotherly love. That's not a trust and a, a faith in God that he can make a way even when we don't understand how he'll make a way. And if anything that we've learned through our history is that God does not go by the laws of the land. God does not go by uh, what man dictates is right or wrong. God's word is true, and it's limitless in its ability to change lives if we simply stop being so stingy with what little we have. Now, we can't choose or decide who is worthy of being treated as equals. But the lawyer asked the question, not seeking an answer, but only to validate his own conclusions. The idea that some are neighbors and some aren't. This man, this lawyer, wanted to get to heaven. And he knew that he needed to treat other people neighborly. So instead of doing what needed to be done, he sought to determine who should really be his neighbors. It's easy to help those that look like you. Uh, I, I remember when I was young, uh, when I got to Moody, I think I was like 26, 27 years old, maybe not, I don't know, 2008. So what's that, 25 years old? When I got to Moody, uh, it was on Clark and, uh, I'm sorry, Chicago and Wales, Chicago and LaSalle, right outside Cabrini Green. I remember growing up in Chicago and Cabrini Green being the place that you avoid. <laughs> But by the time I got to Moody, the whole entire community had changed. There was nothing but, like, white homeless people outside from the YMCA that was on Chicago. And I remember telling myself, I'm not giving no money to another white homeless person because I felt like there were so many black homeless people, and they needed the money more than the white person. I let the trick of the enemy tell me that white people have it better than black people, and I convinced myself that a white homeless man is probably getting more money than a black homeless man, so I'm not going to contribute to him. I'll hold my money for a black... And, and even trying to explain it now in this lesson, it's the most absurd concept in the world. But I, in my poverty, a broke seminary student, decided that even though God was continuing to bless me, I recognized the need for others to be blessed, but I decided I'm not going to bless him because he looks like that, or he looks like that. Uh, when I see kids on exit ramps, on on ramps, on expressways, and they're dancing and singing and playing the drums for change. Uh, oftentimes, if it's an organized sports team with a uniform on, I'll give them money because I feel they're out there for a purpose. But if it's just somebody out there that looks like they're up to no good, I'll decide based on their looks, their hairstyle, their continence, their approach, oh, he's just going to use the money for no good. I'm not going to give him anything. It's not for us to worry. And maybe it's not that extreme in our lives, but we do the same thing in church. If we don't like the direction the pastor is going, if we don't like the last purchase of the ministry, we withhold our tithes and offering. The church got enough money. They don't need any money. You see what the pastor's driving. You see what they just bought. Our responsibility to God and the kingdom of God is not to look at others and evaluate what we think they need, but rather look to the blessings that God has given us and look for how we can use those blessings to further the kingdom. Because the truth is, God does not bless us based on how that homeless man, that children, that church uses our resources. God blesses us based on our willingness to sacrifice the little resources that we have and trust that those that, those that God has placed in our lives, that God has placed over us, that God has placed in our paths, are obedient to God and their job. In other words, uh, I can't question if an airline uses my ticket money to do the right thing. Be but I don't worry about it because I need uh, the service. Uh, but when I can be a little bit more picky, there's a big boycott right now about Facebook that was about two, three months ago uh, because of their lack of addressing hate groups. Because we don't technically need the service, people were willing to take their money and their advertising dollars away in order to push them and motivate them to do the right thing. My brothers and sisters, we can't be so selfish when we decide to do the right thing. There are going to be some times that some stores that we like that aren't doing the right thing that we're going to have to say no. Uh, but in the, other, in the same vein, we must recognize that there are some times in our lives that our job is to do the right thing because we've been instructed to and trust that those that we are submitting to do the right thing in their lives. So, for instance, when I pay my taxes, I don't assume the government always does the right thing, but I know that's my responsibility. And then I look for other ways to hold the government accountable. 
It's the same thing, my brothers and sisters, when we're dealing with the homeless, dealing with those that are hurt, dealing with those that we would not normally consider neighbors. It's not our job to dictate how and when we bless them. It's our job to find ways to hold them accountable to make sure that they're using the blessings they receive and according to God's will in their life. Now, how do we do that? Uh, uh, the, 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 the easiest way to do it is by sharing the gospel of the world, or, uh, of, the word of, 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 of Jesus Christ, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ birth, life, death, and resurrection. If Christians everywhere are using their gifts to further the kingdom of God, then we can trust that those that we bless around us, regardless of what they look like or how we anticipate them using the blessings, we can trust that our message is so strong that eventually it will break through and change their lives. What I'm trying to say is that if we keep on doing what we're supposed to be doing, Living a life pleasing to God, portraying God's love in all that we say, that we do, and that we are. We don't have to worry about how others receive us because eventually our message will break through and they'll use whatever we give them. They'll use whatever they have to also be a blessing to others in the kingdom of God. And if there's ever a breakdown in that cycle, we need not look to those that we don't consider neighborly, but we need to look to ourselves as the church. And what is it that we're doing that's masking the word of God, that's dimming the light of God, where others aren't seeing God in our love and in our actions? The truth is, if we're godly, no matter what we do for others, they should see God and be pushed further towards salvation. And if they're not, it's not on them, it's on us. Uh, so not only do we see the basic commands in the lives of believers, and we ask, answer the question, who is my neighbor? But in verses 30 through 32, we see a neighbor is anyone in need. The text reads, then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by the other side. So Jesus tells the story of a man traveling to Jerusalem, uh, from, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, from, right, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this was a dangerous road down a mountainous path, and we must remember, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, most of us city boys, we don't, we don't really get this. I always tell the story, first time I went to Mississippi, they let us go walking at night, and the first thing I realized in Mississippi, they don't have roads and they don't have lights. And once it got dark, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And all I started hearing is all these sounds from the woods and the trees, animals I ain't never heard of before. And uh, I thought, living in the hood in Chicago, that I would want to just live someplace where I didn't have to hear sirens and gunshots all night. But that first night in Mississippi, I would have traded in that darkness and them animal calls for them gunshots in a second. But anyway, one of the things that it made me realize is that underdeveloped land, uh, there's no way to really tell what's in front of you. And the walk, the road that you travel is a very dangerous road. Not only could you trip and fall, not only are there animals and, 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 and enemies uh, that can attack you, but there's also plenty of hiding spa space, uh, spaces and areas for people that are seeking to hurt uh, or rob you. So this road is a mountainous terrain, a uh, winding road, dark, and it's known for having people that lay in wait uh, to, uh, to jump you, to uh, take you, to uh, take your stuff, to rob you. So uh, let me, let me kind of take an aside or parenthetically add this. Since we know how this lesson ends, since we know that the Samaritan was eventually helped, one thing that I want to just throw in is that some roads in life are unavoidable. Now, we don't know why the Samaritan was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, but I assume that it was important. And I assume he recognized the dangers of this road. My brothers in life, don't be scared to travel down the road that God sends you down, uh, even if it looks and appears to be dangerous. For one, if God is with you, you're guaranteed to make it out. But then two, even if you stumble along your road, even if there's the enemy laying in wait to tear you down, God will still send someone or find a way to restore you and carry you on your way. And so we often look at the Samaritan as the only person in the story as an example, or the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. But we can also look at this man that was jumped. Whatever reason he went on his road, he had to. Uh, but because he was obedient to the road that he was taking, I'm assuming, 
that he was still blessed and restored. And so there are going to be times in our life when we go down dangerous paths. We shouldn't be fearful. But also when we are attacked, when the enemy seeks to take us out, we can trust that God will send someone our way uh, to still help us out and help us get back on our feet. So right back to the lesson, I just wanted to add that in that. But the priest and the Levite, they look to their religious practices and their concern for their own safety as excuses to validate uh, ignoring the man in need. So the priest and the Levite. The Levite, we know that's the, uh, the, uh, the tribe that served as worship leaders, often uh, distanced themselves from others, uh, lived to the point where they isolated themselves so that they wouldn't be tarnished or drawn into the practices of the other uh, tribes. But the priest knows he can't touch anyone with blood. And either the man looks like he's bleeding or dead, and the priest wants nothing to do with him. He doesn't want to defile himself. And he recognizes that this may also be a trap. That they may have someone faking like they're hurt as a setup. He goes to check on him and they come out and jump him. But for whatever reason, whether it was for his own safety or his religious beliefs, the priest decided, I'm not going to help this man. And then the Levite, he came by and did the same thing. Now, the, uh, it's funny that Jesus uses Levite, but the reason why, I don't want to say funny, but the reason why he uses Levite, because those are the people that worship God. And you would expect that if anyone would have a desire to help out those that are in need, it would be the Levite amongst the other tw- out of all the other 12 tribes. Uh, and so uh, the condition of being uh, beaten and bloody gave them reason to ignore him. Now, regardless of our reasons, there is no reason to neglect or ignore those in need because we often worry about things that are beyond our control anyway. The truth is, if it was a trap, it might have been a trap. But uh, I've learned that when I'm the most careful, when I'm doing everything right, I'm still vulnerable to the attack of the enemy. And so we can't live our lives in such a fearful state that we're so heavenly good, heavenly bound, we're no earthly good. That we're so religious, we're so pious, we're so sanctified and set apart that we can't even interact with those that need us most. Uh, I say it all the time when I was growing up in, uh, in my neighborhood, I live in the same neighborhood that I grew up in, you would take one foot and step on the neighbor's yard and they would come running out their house, get off my yard, respect my grass. And, or you would see an older lady uh, carrying groceries in the house and all the kids running to her trying to help her get her groceries. You would see the old man cut his yard and then go over to the lady's yard next to him and just extend a, a helping hand. I watched as I grew up in a community. We didn't have no money. We, we weren't well educated. We didn't have the nicest of jobs, but we were a loving community that supported each other. We treated everyone as neighbors. Now in the same community, I see people rushing into their homes, closing their doors, scared to talk to their neighbors. Old ladies worried about getting in their homes because of what someone may do. People driving for miles and miles to find gas because they don't feel like they're safe in their own gas station because of their neighbors standing outside. And and what the enemy has convinced us is that those that look like us, those that live next door to us, those that grow up exactly like us, those that go to school with us, those that even sometimes go to church with us, they aren't our true neighbors because they don't look like us. They don't sound like us. Their hair looks different than us. They smell different than us. And this, this trick of the enemy has permeated black America to the point where we look down on our own brothers and sisters as if we didn't look like them a few years ago or we didn't have the same habits they had a few months ago. My brothers and sisters, just because God has delivered us and brought us so far does not give us an excuse to look down on others that have not yet been blessed with the opportunity to grow as much as we have grown. And that's the lesson today. Uh, We often worry about things beyond our control. All we can control is being obedient to God and using the gifts that he has given us as a blessing for others. So not only do we see the basic commands in the lives of believers, we, see, we answer the question, who is my neighbor? We recognize a neighbor as anyone in need. But finally, as we end this lesson, we see a despised Samaritan offers a helping hand. Verses 33 through 37. The text reads, but a certain Samaritan as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring the oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, 
gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So the Samaritan, who was considered the lowest of the low, passed by this man and helped. After the priest passed by, after the Levi passed by and did nothing, it was the Samaritan who stopped. Now, Jesus plays on this long-lasting feud between Jew and Samaritan. Samaritans were considered unclean. They came from the uh, northern tribes and were often from mixed marriages. They worshipped idol gods, and they were considered the worst of the worst, the most unneighborly of people that you can. Uh, and and, and uh, only in the world that we live in do we assign values to people based on their titles, their heritage, their position, their ethnicity, their race, their culture, or their gender. And this priest and this Levite was guilty of doing the same thing. The irony is the Samaritan, who was considered the lowest of the low, I guess he had no one to look down on. And when you have no one to look down on, the only direction to look is up. So my brothers and sisters, I would challenge us today that this lesson teaches us to find a way to not look down on someone, on others, and the easiest way to do that is to knock ourselves off the pedestal we placed ourselves on. I know that we have a little money. I know that we got a little education. We might live nice, dress nice, drive nice, even work nice. But my brothers and sisters, that does not make us better than anybody else in this world. And if we stop looking at ourselves so highly, perhaps we would be able to not look at others so lowly. Because if it, we're all one paycheck away, uh, one bad relationship away, uh, one bad habit away, uh, one bad action away, one bad word away from losing all that we have. And then who would we have to look down on? The trick of the enemy is to take the blessings of God, the blessings of the kingdom of God, and convince us that that makes us more important than the next person. But my brothers and sisters, if we can just learn that we're all equal in God's sight, I guarantee we will be able to treat people a lot better. A neighbor is one that doesn't look at the differences, but rather the similarities. And the similarities are that we are all God's creation, and therefore no one is better than anyone else. This was not a lone lesson today. It's a story that we're all familiar with, but such a powerful lesson. And I'll say it one more time. The best way to stop looking at others so lowly is to stop looking at ourselves so highly. For we all fall short of the glory of God, and we were all in need of the sacrifice of God when he sent his son and when Jesus gave his life. What a wonderful lesson. I praise God for each and every one of you that have shared with us this, uh, this morning. Uh, continue to pray for our pastor, for our church, for our city, for our country, for all of humanity. Let's continue to pray for all those infected and affected by the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's uh, uh, early voting has extended to our local precincts this past Wednesday, October 14th. So let's make sure that we're all voting. Uh, avoid the most certain, uh, most certainly guaranteed loan lines on election day by finding time to early vote. I believe the request for absentee ballot deadline is October 28th. So make sure you get that in as soon as possible if you plan on requesting a ballot. And then you can register to vote in person from now until November 3rd, uh, the day of the election. Uh, we say that voting is your right, but voting is a responsibility. As a citizen, uh, as a, uh, we have a responsibility to hold those that are in power accountable. And the only way that we can do that is by, with our vote. And so we implore you to vote. And... Uh, share that responsibility that others gave their lives that we might have. Uh, we ask that you join us at 11 a.m. for our worship hour where our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, will be bringing the message. Uh, let's continue to pray for him and his family and the decisions that God has given him to make regarding this church and our district. Uh, we thank you all that have given and sacrificed to continue to support this ministry, even in the midst of this pandemic. We have four ways to give here at Friendship. You can give the cash app dollar sign friendship chicago you can give online on our website fbcchicago.org use the giving tab in the upper right hand corner you can text the word give to 773-992-1462 and follow the prompts 
or you can mail your check and money order or check or money order into the church here, uh, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Uh, continue to pray for me and my family. Continue to pray for our church. And if God see, says so, I'll see you next Sunday at 930. Uh, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, this lesson that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Th Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for making it available to us and help you. Thank you for uh, its ability to challenge us. Help us to teach us that we're wrong and we're not always right. And help us to show us the way to be better in your will. Father, help us to remember one thing, if nothing else today, that the best way to stop looking down on others is to stop looking at ourselves so highly. Help us to recognize that you love each and every one of us the same, that we're all your children, and therefore all, all of us are part of your plan. So help us to treat others with respect, with dignity, to love others the way we uh, want to be treated, and to love you like there is nobody else that matters, to love you and no other gods. We thank you for this church. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for this time. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. <laughs>